uh, women possibly who do not have the access or technology or the means to be you know part of this group today and uh, my status is as someone on the payrolls i am an employee i am an employee of 3.6 million women all right so uh, that's the reason why i'm here and uh, well sonal said oh, sorry carol said very clearly that this is one open ended unformatted st unstructured uh, discussion where there will be no presentations but then uh, carol um, i would like to take this opportunity to tell a story uh, i'll take just be 2 minutes or maybe uh, less than that really really fast yeah yeah very fast because at the end of the day we all uh, you know in the long term we all story right and what is uh, human history but just a collection of stories of you know achievements human endeavor whether it's uh, these are real stories factual stories mythical stories or even technical stories so i'm going to tell you one i'm going to tell you one and uh, i'm going to share my screen so if you will allow me to show a few visuals because what no 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 i'm sorry i'm sorry that's an absolute non negotiable no panels no presentations as right okay, no no presentations just a photograph no i'm sorry really not even photographs because what uh, oh, no i just could have done is something that i i'll take the entire day to describe no then come i think you know what okay that's a meeting outside of the session all right all right perfect perfect no issue at all so like i said i represent 3.6 million uh, women here who are basically my employers they pay me my salary and uh, i am under the employment on the payrolls okay so uh, the story is essentially something which originates from um, where i come from i belong to gujarat which is on the uh, as all of you know and many of you uh, are aware is a state in india on the western side and uh, my employers they are basically rural women who have created an economic opportunity for themselves and they've done it for themselves there's nothing that we i as a person have come and done for them or anyone else they've created for them an economic opportunity out of something that they do routinely as part of their family and social structure something that they already had an expertise in but they converted that expertise into an economic opportunity as a means of earning remunerative livelihood contributing meaningfully and significantly to the family income which in turn accelerated their elevation within the family structure to a status of economic equality gave them within the existing social structure some amount of financial some measure of financial independence and without disrupting or disturbing the existing social fabric or the family equilibrium in any manner okay and across three or now i guess as a 70 year old movement that i'm talking about across four generations they've managed to not only elevate their socio economic status but of the community along around them and they have achieved what all of us ultimately aspire to achieve live a happy healthy fruitful and meaningful life okay and having means to the and creating for with their own effort and with their own um, what i would say you know uh, with their own effort the kind of resources that were required to be able to create this entity which we call amul so i mean without Oh, much really, Pavan. That is really great. Yeah. So that's the story that I wanted to tell. Uh, I would really like to invite a lot of people who can once travel starts post COVID to come down to this part of the country and see for yourself. Because what I can't, what Karen won't allow me to show you through photographs is something that you got to see with your own eyes to be able to understand what I'm really talking about. See what more better than that can happen, right, Pavan? By making them come, then if you show them the pictures, they'll not come. See, I'm telling you, I'm giving you a better opportunity still. Right. Great. Thank you so much, Pavan, for putting that uh, out there, and you know, maybe getting people to get really interested to. I Sorry, yeah. Carol. Just a quick thing. Power. All opportunity for you to post the picture on the event feed and put okay. that story there. People will look at it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank sure. you so much. There you go, Power. We we are very good people. We make sure you have all the options in the world to interact. Yeah. Great. So, um, do I have someone? Yes, Minal. She's please go for it. Uh, thank you, Pavan. That is such a heartening note to uh, you know kick this conversation off. So, thank you so much. My question is that there are lots of interesting stories. There are a lot of positive 
uh, you know, um, validations of gender and minority and vulnerability. People who have been in those societies who've made a lot of impact um, within their region as Amul, okay, as which is a which is which is an organization which is a staffer in so many areas, right? Not only in the women uh, uh, investment of their growth and their independence in so many sectors, but so many other things we all know as a proud Indian. The point is, has have you seen any change or have you been able to cascade what you have done at Amul into other organizations? One is that. Um, and is there a possibility of you making those? I mean, I know that there are case studies, I mean, undoubtedly, but it is not part of regular conversation, right? So that's what I want to do is the whole showcasing piece. And going back again to what Urvashi said, it's about being intentional. Another conversation that came into my mind is when Angela Merkel, 16 years she has been, uh, one a, a very leading, um, you know, a change maker of the world, leave alone Germany, right? But today I was reading, I was reading an article and there they said that people don't have confidence in women. I mean, who greater than Angela Merkel who's made these impacts? But yet we are hearing those stories and from a person of that kind of level, leverage and leadership. So who are the rest of us, uh, you know, to try and drive this and make this something that we are not fighting for, but make it equitable, make it normal. Why are we having even a conversation on this? Great. Thank you so very much, Minal. Absolutely. And I'm going to request everybody, can we please uh, stick with the with the topic of challenges? Because we will come to capabilities and great, uh, you know, examples of, of work that is being done. But right now, I really want to kind of focus on what are these challenges that we are facing? And as Minal just said, you know, how do we, uh, being intentional is the first challenge because just being aware that the problem exists and accepting that that problem exists, I think is, is really, really important because I know of many who tell, turn around and tell me, and this is both men and women, mind you, it is not just men, right? And I always say that you cannot have, this conversation on gender cannot be about men versus women, right? No. So, so definitely it is, I've heard this from both men and women who turn around and tell me, I can't believe it's such a big deal. It is a big deal, you know, please. It is a big deal. And and we need to make some noise around it. So thank you Mirna, for uh, adding to that. Great. Any more, anybody else wants to talk about the challenge that they feel they face? Yes, Dr. Renoka, please come in. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'm uh, Renuka Singh. I am a sociologist, a former professor of sociology from JNU, New Delhi. And... Uh, I have been working on gender issues for the last 40 years. So I have experience with both urban and uh, rural women. So I feel, first of all, this distinction has to be made when we are talking about, you know, gender parity. Uh, and the other factor which is very important is the role of modernity, urbanization and globalization, how it creates an imbalance and how it also removes an imbalance from our lives. So this is the biggest challenge, the space between uh, the public realm and the private realm. So this dichotomy has to be addressed. I think this is the biggest challenge that we face. Not to forget about various other challenges like you know, poverty, armed conflict, education, health, career advancement, nurturing the girl child, or uh, family and community level activities or environmental protection. You know, there are so many issues, but the major one that we all need to look at is the uh, sex ratio in India, especially the regional variation in India. If you look at Haryana and Punjab, for example, in India, you have the lowest sex ratio over there and things like amniocentesis, female infanticide, harassment of brides, dowry, rape, all these issues and the increasing violence against women, even especially during the lockdown. So, you know, there are a lot of challenges that are there in the lives of women, both urban and rural. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. And, you know, I think 
it's not just about urban or rural it's even across geographies and boundaries country boundaries you know so we we okay. do see that there are many issues that women face no matter which part of the world they are in so you know it's uh, we talk about urban and rural in india i'm pretty sure i know more, a lot of that from across the world and and we do have joy here with us from uk so i think joy i would like to bring you in here and tell us maybe a little bit of perspective from uh, from uk and you know bring in that uh, global cross border uh, perspectives as well please over to you well that last point that you made was really valid because um you know just the other night i was watching television with my husband and they flashed up a commercial about a woman who was trapped and it was education for women in the lockdown about how to get help if they're in an abusive relationship because that's been one of the big concerns with the lockdown is the more vulnerable women and children being in homes where they're not uh, you know being treated very well and it's interesting to hear you guys speak obviously in the UK um, we don't have this huge disparity in the same sense uh, of the urban and rural for sure. However, we, and, and it's interesting because we probably have a different kind of disparity. That disparity has to do with technology and, and, and more so with the lockdown and all of the, the changes that are happening. In many ways for us, it's, it's advancing women. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I will say that one of the challenges prior to COVID was that women were unable to get flexible part-time work uh, from home. <laughs> and now for women in the UK where technology is available, both urban and rural, um, one of the things that has happened is there's been this huge opportunity to work flexibly from home. Uh, and, uh, and, and there's challenges that present with that because in the UK still a large percentage of women are still in charge of the home as well. Uh, which I'm sure is the case in many parts of the world. Uh, so you have this challenge of having to run a business or work for a business and also take care of children at the same time, not adding in the difficulties of, of an unhappy home. So, but I would, I would say for us, you know, we've probably, um, the challenges are, are, are more on parity within technology uh, especially on the higher levels. And I'll, I'll give one example and then move, let someone else talk. But uh, I, I was invited to have a conversation with someone who owns a big tech company in the UK. And I went on to do some research on their website and the entire team and board were white males and they serve majority of women. And I was kind of shocked to see that there's no one, the product that they build, which is primarily used by women, was not being built by women or involved with women. So, you know, there, the, uh, there's different levels that we certainly have to deal with across the globe. Uh, in the UK, the conversation is very much about getting women in the higher levels of technology, but also helping women to leverage technology to get involved in the conversation and not get left behind with the pandemic. Great, thank you very much, Joy. And I think what you say sounds very familiar, I think, to all of us. We've seen domestic violence cases really, really rise so high in India. And again, it doesn't matter which part of India you are in, because we've seen it across. And it doesn't matter how educated you are or how, how rich you are or how poor you are. This is a, a, a completely perennial issue that uh, you know is, we have, is being faced by women all over. Yeah, hi, Sharmila. I see that your hand is up and great to have you here after quite some time. Yes, so please. Yeah. Hi, Karen. Karen. Thanks so much. Yeah, I've been listening to all these conversations. So I work with parents in the parenting space and well-being. And uh, the last nine, 10 months have been really, really a uh, game changer for many women. And I echo what Joy says that, uh, let's start with the domestic violence part. I mean, a lot of that is happening and uh, they don't know. And domestic violence is, and uh, abuse is not just physical, right? It's also mental and emotional. And as we go up the, you know, towards the richer, the more educated, it's actually more emotional uh, abuse that's happening. I work with parents, as I said, and we talk about uh, equal parenting. But even in the women who are working, they are the most educated. Even then, there is no gender parity. They are being, uh, you know, all the work 
uh, the they are trying to you know struggle between how they work looking after their children doing the household work and when you ask the husbands the husbands are like uh, you know not too many husbands are pitching in and we find that very surprising because before they had babies it was an equal partnership and suddenly once they are uh, mothers the fathers just decide that they are not part of this parenting process and that's what we are trying to get in by saying that we need to get an equal parenting the child needs both the parents it's not just for physical health even for uh, their mental and emotional this thing and once you do that once we have the gender parity lot of the other issues that are around it all these things the rape uh the men thinking that they are more than it's all happening in the family so if we start changing the way we think the way we tell our boys because in most of our indian families the boys we look forward right so genocide is leading to that female uh, uh, the thing so if we start getting all these in place i think we are going to work so i work a lot on this with parents to say that please bring up the children because you are the ones who are looking at the future of india if you all don't bring up your children well then uh, i think we have a problem because it's not at the schools that they learn it's at home what signals are you giving and the fact that the fathers are not helping at home is giving a very wrong signal because that's what the child is seeing whether the male or the female child both of them and they are carrying that to adulthood and then they are doing the same in their family life so we really need to work on this thanks thank karen you. thank you so very much ramila that was such a uh, important thing dolly i'll come to you in just a little bit because i think i got a brilliant uh, uh, what you call it segue to what rajat has put over here you know and what sharmila mentioned about young boys and i think rajat has posted something very very interesting about five steps to educate young boys to respect women uh, really awesome rajat uh, may i invite you to please come in and say a few words on that and we have to start young as sharmila also said and i think what rajat is going to definitely talk about sure yeah thank you karen thank you so much uh well i've been working with uh teenagers directly uh and of course parents and asher mila shared of the last 7 8 months it's been it's been a time when uh you know families have been together uh i have observed like as you said it's not about the education it's not about how affluent or non affluent you are it's about a mindset which has been existing in our country for very long a patriarchal a patriarchal uh, society that we are living in still so uh, i have observed that uh it starts very young you know like uh, when when a child is observing the pair, the father speaking to the mother in a certain way it starts from there when the child sees a mother working in the kitchen and not going and working it starts over there when the first time the father hits the mother or there is there is any kind of domestic violence it starts from there when uh, in certain cases like when you and i'm working with a teenager and i and you know uh, in india we have a lot of joint families so the grandparents and everybody is staying together uh, i've still observed till date that the grandmothers would listen to the husband to the to the son more than the daughter in law so if something has to be put across it has to be put across to the father and through not to the uh mother so there are so when i talk about the five steps so this article came into my mind about educating uh young boys to respect women the five steps i would say first it would be to set up a good example so the first way to teach respect to kids is to treat them with respect sometimes you observe parents are very harsh on their kids uh you know who think like especially the boys the boys need a lot of learning here uh and they fail to understand the settling for the child like boys don't cry there are certain uh you know things we've said over there so talking politely to a kids never shouting in front of uh, i mean either of the partner shouting at each other in front of the child watch out if if your kid is misbehaving with his mother so when you're shouting at the mother it's the first sign that your child is tending to disrespect women a uh, monitor uh, so again even uh, for that matter a lot of uh, uh, we see a lot of violent uh, stuff which is on tv these days and allowing children not to do that uh 
just have very open conversations with them conversations especially when it comes to even even sex education for that matter because i still remember i had a parent contacting me all the way from himachal and telling me that my son uh, he was so curious about the whole porn thing that he touched his 8 year old sister in an appro- inappropriate way just to get an idea of that so even sex education here you know becomes a major part otherwise we see there is so much uh, you know it it leads so there's a lot of learning that is and, and i'm working with a lot of boys here and i'm 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 enabling them to understand and 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 have a mindset which is respectful towards all humans not necessarily women but towards all humans and and women form a major part of it mm-hmm. so uh, i mean they are so teaching them the meaning of consent what really consent means you know every man boy must know that saying no is the end of conversation and it's 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 the woman's decision that a man must follow in that case so uh, understanding consent there is also a very classic case in uh, so they uh, you know very educated and affluent family i was working with and they had sent their daughter to a hostel and she was staying in the hostel for very long and when and they also have a younger son who's like 8 years younger to him again you know uh trying for get children till you get a boy is still a thing till date so <laughs> so they you know the girl came back from hostel after a good so she was in class grade 5 and she went to the hostel grade 10 she came back and uh, you know she she came to me for coaching and she said that i i know there is there is so many privileges that my brother has that i still don't you know i cannot pursue uh education at certain places but he can i have restrictions which he doesn't have okay i understand they are teenagers and they do do their little manipulative ways but then that's a fact because that is happening in those cases so a lot of things are happening in 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 our world and if we can educate our boys from a very young age then we can see a much more united world a world which is which is more harmonious and more peaceful and which is respectful towards yes. towards mankind in general yes. towards woman kind in general <laughs> thank you so very much but i think it is just human kind in general it's not about women of course that is a starting point but i think it is the the very fact that we differentiate is where the starting point is so we need to stop that and make it about human kind thank you so much rajat that was really really interesting and yes anupama i, I know absolutely it is a completely mardo wali baat thing please go for it uh thanks karon and yeah um, amazing prudent points um, shared by you rajat and also uh, by sarmila earlier uh so yeah this is bang on what we are trying to do we are saying that uh while it's important for us to also empower women and, and help them gain an gain an agency to make their own decisions and move forward in life uh the fact is that we also need to engage the men uh yes we need to go to the boys in schools but you know we also need to talk to men of all uh, ages across uh, uh, professions and other areas and public um having said that what happens is a lot of work which is going on world over and also in india around engaging with men uh you know focuses on violence and while for a, not even for a moment do i believe that we shouldn't do that what we are not doing is we are not talking about uh, equities um, uh, with men in in terms of uh, you know women working i personally believe that for us to gain any agency or respect in the value chain of human beings we have to be economically empowered so uh, if a woman is working it's there for the children in the family to see it's there for the in-laws to see and because we are all living in a patriarchal system where men and women both are deeply ingrained with the patriarchal beliefs whether we believe them or not you know all of us here will have some patriarchal beliefs that we haven't sort of reflected into and realize that oh yeah i can also be patriarchal sometimes so um you know uh, it's a huge concerted effort and that's why um, you know when we talk about equal half we have conversations that range uh, through you know a very wide uh, masculinity framework 
uh, and 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 how masculinities actually prevent men from embracing uh, the the feminine or embracing gender equality. So, for example, this notion of the man being the provider, which is a, a global notion, it's not. Uh, limited to india i'm sure joy will agree it exists in the uk and as she shared um women in the uk are responsible for the household which also means the kids um so you know as long as we believe that men are providers women will always remain the caregivers it has to be an equal half it has to be equal partners in in whether you are bringing in the money in the house or you're raising the children or the household or whatever it is and this is intrinsically linked to the fact that today care the care economy or the care related work that the world does is led by women for some reason we believe certain jobs are done better by women men don't go into them the jobs remain the lower paid jobs and we never have gender pay parity also which again is linked to you know when you for example when you have a child and somebody has to take a break because there is probably a part of you know uh, the phase in an infant's life where um, you know uh, uh, an adult supervision uh, of the family is required then at that time the natural call is for the woman to take the break because women are always paid less than the men so all these factors are intrinsically linked and i think that the first thing we need to do is economically empower women make sure every woman in the world works and earns her own financial independence so that we have the agency to make our decisions and we are also valued unfortunately if you don't bring in the money in the world today you are not valued great great thank you so very much anupam i think you're absolutely right and uh, that is one of the things that we started with when we started working is focusing on you know the economic in- independence of women but we also quickly realized that while that's great that also can have unintended impact of creating rifts and problems within the families and so we've learned that you know you have to look at it as a holistic issue and a holistic challenge and i think pavan you know what the the example you've given an earlier and about amul i'm sure you you've dealt with a lot of those kind of issues as well so economic independence is also very very critical but on it it is a foundation on which you need to build and solve many other issues so thank thank you very much anupam for bringing in that perspective um i am going to ask uh, ms kumar to come into the conversation uh and and yeah take it forward i i can see he's already put some very very interesting things on the chat and look forward to hearing it go ahead please Uh, yeah well uh, this has nothing to do with what i put on the chat but uh, <laughs> more on uh, uh, the reality as it exists today uh, i mean i work exclus- extensively with the sdgs and the sdgs talk a lot about diversity they talk about equality etc 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 yet the sdgs at no point advocate mechanisms for promoting equality i can give you an example uh, joy talked about women raising the family other panelists talks about talk about women being the primary caregiver as far as the family is concerned when the uh, in laws or the parents get elderly it's usually the women who take a break and take care of the kids or uh, take care of the senior citizens and this leads to actually women either part- uh, going into uh, working part time or dropping out of the workforce totally you will never be able to achieve equality if this continues some of the metrics that we are now talking about as part of the sdgs is for organizations to create crash facilities within their organizations so working women don't have to leave their think about their kids being left behind at home they can bring kids to work leave them in the crash and go check in on their kids during work hours itself there is also a mandate requiring that organizations have to create facilities for providing care for senior citizens if such members exist within families we will have to put such metrics into organizations to actually determine if they are sustainable or not any organization which does not provide such facilities for women should be deemed as not sustainable 
Absolutely. For the simple reason that they don't treat men and women equal. Yes. I mean, it could be, I'm not saying only women, there could be single fathers who are in this situation and who may have to drop out of workforce purely for this reason. You, I mean, we need to put pressure on the organizations to create such facilities. Unless we do that, this narrative is going to continue the same way 10 years or even 15 years from today. Uh, 50 years from today, women are always going to be singled out as second citizens. Absolutely. And we will always be talking about equality between the genders, equal pay, etc., 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 which will only remain talk. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mr. Kumara. That is really great too. So I'm just going to get Sharmila in real quick uh, to bring, we want to now start moving towards capabilities. What are some of the innovations, solutions, uh, you know, kind of ideas, initiatives that maybe is happening within the room or even outside the room that we could start bringing into the conversation. So uh, I will go with what Sharmila has to say, but I'd like you to start thinking along these lines because that's the next part of where we move from, from challenges to capabilities. Great, Sharmila. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, no, my... And my battery is on this thing, I'll charge it. Okay, no, quick. So my, what I want to say is actually a mix between what we are talking about, the problems and the capabilities, because exactly what uh, Mr. Murthy was saying about, uh, you know, uh, how people think. So when I had my baby, my husband actually wanted to quit his job and look after the children because I was earning more than him. But um, 25 years ago, it was unheard of. People were like, how can you, your husband can't do it. His parents just threw up it and said, Ki, there is no way our son can, you know, stay at home and do it. So there are lots of uh, fathers who would like to do it, who would like to be part of this journey. But I think the, uh, you know, the atmosphere, the this thing, our mindset needs to change for us to accept that. Uh, many times we are going out and that's i th think that's what we need to talk about going on on capabilities about a mindset change because whenever we are leaving our children at home we are saying and i keep saying this in my classes that my husband is looking after the children i said no you should not say that you should say my husband is parenting he is also part of that he is it's not that he's doing you a favor he is as much involved in this process as you are so once you start making the change, that is when, because even the women, I think in our mind, it's like if our husband helps us, we feel like, okay, people will say, oh my God, you're so lucky your husband is helping you as if it's an exception. The change needs to be that it needs to be part of our life instead of an exception. Uh, and the place, uh, this thing, the creches that are there. So I used to work with Unilever and we used to have a very good crash in Unilever. So most of the parents would leave it. So a lot of the husbands who are working in Unilever, wives are working somewhere else. So the husband would, you know, go and check up on the child, obviously, because he's the only parent there. But the thing was, even in such an organization, it would be like, wow, you are, when the wife would come, it would be like, wow, you're so lucky your husband goes and checks up on this. And so I'm saying that it's not financial. We are talking about, you know, how we need to be financially independent. I'm talking about, these are some of the most financially independent people that we have in our country. And even there, you know, we have this problem. So we need a mindset change along with all this. And that's only when that is going to work. So I wanted to just make that point before we Absolutely. move to the next part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Amla. I think that's something exactly which I also put in the group saying that, you know, financial independence is important, very, very important. But, you know, the mindset of people around that woman is equally important for her to even enjoy and be, uh, be successful, uh, you know, without any kind of stress. Uh, in her own right, you know. So I think you're, you're absolutely right in what you said. Okay, great. I will bring in Sonal, Sonal and Minal, but I will request both of you to be really, really brief for the very simple reason I do want us to start moving into um, other topics uh, because Joy also brought up a very interesting thing on the chat saying, 
talking about getting loans for bank for women and you know whether it is for their business or, or for any case in that case right uh, purchases i think women as consumers so we've been talking a lot about women as community members but i think and and homemakers and you know uh, but now i'd like to really start moving into women in the workplace women as entrepreneurs so so maybe a quick uh, quick uh, uh, liner from you sonal and then minal and then we move on to that topic yeah thank you so much for your understanding Great, so now go for it. Right, thanks. I'm just going to try to stick uh, to uh, some of your points and add one more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank uh, you. No, I mean because I work in monitoring evaluations, so I'm talking about evidence. So we know, and it is extremely surprising and very distressing that the labor force participation of women and even educated women in India has been declining. So this is a huge issue that people are trying to understand. So from a social point of view, we've talked about caregiving has become extremely critical. And because of longevity, the caregiving of the elderly has become very difficult. So when we look at it from one point of view, you know, I mean, why should the woman be caregiving alone? Why not the man? So again, at that point, we start talking about some of these strategic gender needs. But let's talk about practical. Practically, what are some of the things that an organization, a company can do to ensure that these practical needs of women are addressed? So this again is something that we've discussed, but I think we need to be very clear that the labor force participation will not go up unless we address these very, very practical needs. The second thing I wanted to say is that again, through evidence and my work, start very, very young. In an evaluation I did for men up to the age of 25, by the time boys are 12, they have already established their gender attitudes. It was so surprising that the mindset is already there. And the other thing I wanted to say is one of the gatekeepers are women themselves. It was the mothers, the grandmothers, the older sisters who were the gatekeepers. They were not allowing the boys to flourish and become more gender fair and have uh, social justice. The last thing I wanted to talk about is in terms of COVID. COVID has brought about so much of understanding about gender disparities, gender violence, so on and so forth. But also in labor force participation, how many women have had to leave their jobs? have had to accept the fact that I can't manage the house, the children, everything at home. I'm not able to do it. And so there has also been a decline, especially in certain jobs where women have left it because these needs were not being addressed. So I think there is a lot that we can do that it's not just having entrepreneurship. It's not enough giving skills and jobs unless you're able to fix this enabling environment in which a woman lives and breathes and works we are not going to find transformative change and men have to be part of that solution. Absolutely. Yes, and that's the solutions we are looking for now moving ahead. Great, Minal, do come in, please. Thank you. I'm not adding anything new. I just want to say that nothing of this is in isolation to the other. If we are talking about financial empowerment, we are talking about education. If we are talking about education, we are talking about equality. If we are talking about mind shift, shift, we are talking about conversations at home because that's where cultural mind shift really takes place. And obviously schools, because I do believe that schools, the, 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 the pressure to impress or influence is higher. Uh, so this is what I want to say that every part of this narrative has to go you know, fit in like a glove into the palm or in the hand. The second piece is really answering, going into the second piece of this or the third piece of this conversation, which is what do we do now where women are not so accepted, we're not getting enough loans, we're not being recognized professionally, etc. My thing is, can we look at the gender issue from a different lens? Uh, we are coded differently. Let's look at the man and the woman, right? It's like looking at a basket of fruit and saying, is the apple sweeter or is the orange? Why can't the apple be as, what should I say, juicy as the orange? Or why can't the orange 
be as crisp as the apple. That will never happen because we are two different entities. I'm saying, can we therefore look at equality from a different parameter? Can in the professional arena, can we equalize with something like a capability? So we evaluate performance, we evaluate targets, we evaluate promotion and salaries and pay, et cetera, on a platform which is not gender-based or I don't have to be included in that board because the government of India says that 2% or 1% have to be, have to be the woman because that again is, is again showing an isolation. It's again saying that, and again, it will be grudging from the man's point of view because they'll say, oh, she is there because of a quota. I'm saying, can we equalize it on certain other benchmarks where you are measured on other metrics and not because on the, on the basis of being kind or being generous with a boss who wants to take you in because you are a woman. Absolutely. absolutely. Well, there are, there are a, a lot of issues that go with that as well, because you, as you said, you know, about being intentional and then of course you don't want to be looked at as being partial or unfair or injustice. So there are many, many dimensions to that uh, conversation, I think, but we will we will come to that. Uh, like I said, I do want to move towards solutions. So I do want people who want to, uh, you know, talk about the activities. Now is your turn to talk about what you are doing. This is exactly where I want to know your innovations, your ideas that you are doing, which will meet some of these challenges or have already met them or, or have uh, discovered certain new insights because of going through those initiatives. So I'd really love to hear uh, any of those kind of thoughts coming from the room. Yeah. Uh, do I have? Yes, Dr. Inka, please go ahead. Over here, I just want to say that, you know, when we are talking about equality and parity, there is no such thing as absolute equality. All our work has shown that you will always have relative equality or proportional equality. There is no such thing as arithmetical equality when we are discussing gender. And uh, secondly, I think uh, many uh, of the speakers have also pointed out, we really need to... Uh, socialize our children differently from day one. So over here, the role of women and mothers and fathers, I think is very important. Why is it that we still have the son preference over here? And why is it that mothers are still not very supportive of their daughters? Do we, don't we need to really uh, rethink about this? Thank you so much for saying that. Pavan, I'll just come to you in one second, okay? Uh, I, uh, you know, thank you so much for saying this. So, so when I get uh, invited to speak about uh, gender equality, you know, uh, in conferences, I, I normally start with saying, uh, and believe me, there's like pin drop silence after that. And I don't know whether it's going to have the same effect here, but I normally end up saying that I don't believe in gender equality, you know? And, and, and I can see the organizer's face looking at me like, what are you doing, you know, kind of a thing. And, and really, I, what I really believe in is gender balance, you know. And why do I say that is, why is it that you and me decide how feminine is a woman, okay. I'm sorry, how feminine, uh, how masculine is a woman and how feminine is a man. Just because you think there are certain traits that are feminine or there are certain traits that are masculine, we then start labeling people as they're too aggressive or, you know, he's too soft, you know. And I mean, that's really because of those kind of things. So I think there's a whole spectrum of masculinity and feminine, femininity in each one of us, you know. So, so we, uh, I may be a woman, but I could have those supposed traits that are masculine, right? Or at some times I could be extremely, extremely, uh, uh, you have men who, uh, who, who are obviously men, but have certain really, really moments where they have been so, so, so uh, considerate that even a woman may probably be saying, "Oh my God, kya kar rahe hai You know, why is he kind of behaving this way? So I think, I think that's what I like to think about. That it's about gender balance and not gender equality. So thank you for kind of. I don't know whether it's the same thought, but at least I, I believe it is in that kind of direction. Yeah, great, Pawan, please do come. Okay, uh, Karen. Uh, we were talking a lot about challenges and solutions, right? I've been listening very uh, uh, attentively to the discussion that's happening. And I do, uh, personally, I feel there's a lot of urban Indian slant to the discussion that we've had so far. Uh, there's nothing more challenging 
than the scenario in rural India, where you know the tradition is so deeply instilled and ingrained in society over centuries. And what I've personally witnessed in Gujarat over the last 25 years that I've worked here on the field is accelerated social change in rural setting, uh, especially when it comes to the socioeconomic status of women and restoring what you so uh, admirably call gender balance. So how did it come about? If I have to just distill one or two things, which I could uh, you know, distill out of 25, almost quarter century of field observations here, one very theory is that there are traditional uh, capabilities which were already there with women. Now those traditional capabilities became technically enhanced. All right. Now whether they they were enhanced through some external inputs or whether they took the initiative with their own hands is a separate discussion. But those technical capabilities became enhanced. They develop along with the highly skilled scientific temperament and scientific capabilities. I'm talking about dairy farming here, and it's a technical subject at the end of the day. And you will find women dairy entrepreneurs who are so skilled in the technical aspects of dairy farming and then enhance those skills, converted that skill enhancement into economic remunerative opportunities. With that came, flow, came in the flow of money into the family. With the flow of money into the family, they got with financial independence that status of economic equality and it restored gender balance to a large extent, leading to mutual respect between the two genders within the family setting and within the social structure of rural Gujarat. And you will find if you, you know, I can tell you from my own experience, if you move around rural Gujarat, you'll find it possibly one of the safest places for women to move around at any point in time because women are respected, women contribute meaningfully. This organization that I represent, they not only have a stake in ownership, but they also manage the organization. They are in decision-making roles here. We have women members or as part of the board of governors who take over the final decision-making body. I, as an employee, am, am, am accountable to them for my delivery and performance. So exactly, if we are able to channelize skills, enhance them, develop them to the extent that those skills automatically command respect and they command, you know, income generation opportunities for the women and with the inflow of money automatically status changes in the society, automatically that uh, equal and mutual respect happens and uh, the social harmony all around. One more very interesting thing, I mean, this is uh, from Western India, where the, uh, the field of operations where I come from. But in my travels across the country, I can again, this is not a universal phenomena of, you know, a skewed uh, uh, gender bias. If you go to the northeastern part of the country, and I, I observe we even have been passing from Bhutan in this um, event, uh, the social structure is completely different as those of you who work in those parts of the country would understand. The so entire social and gender balance equation is completely different in those parts of the country. So it's not a universal phenomenon by any means. And we must also try and see what lessons we can derive from those parts of the country where women automatically in society take the leading role. So that's my, that's my take. I, I really love that idea. I think it is about inspiring roles, uh, role models, and it's also about women supporting women for sure. And again, this is, you know, across all cross cutting, doesn't matter what kind of uh, background or categories you're talking about. I think this is across all of it. And the more, more we can create those role models and the more we can support each other, you know, and in this, when I'm talking with we, I mean, men and women you know, men and women. And I know some fantastic men who have been so much outspoken about uh, uh, what you call it, supporting women. And very much, very often, uh, you know, we've had cases where a lot of negative response comes from something like that. And it's amazing. I mean, you know, how we can be so petty in our thinking. And, and I, I go back to what Sharmila said, you know, that it's about mindsets. It's really about mindsets. And the more we can change the mindsets, I think the better we are going to find, um, the easier we're going to find those solutions to be implemented. Because I think we know the solutions. Let's be honest. It's not that we don't know what needs to be done. We know that. But the minute you want to actually implement it, 
Mm, it is a very, very hard task, right? So thanks so much for bringing that up. And yes, uh, I think we're coming almost to the end of our session, or at least the last half an hour, because we definitely crossed. So I definitely want to give people who have not had a chance to talk till now, to please start putting your hands up, because if you do not speak now, forever hold your peace. Yeah? <laughs> no, I'm kidding, right? But, but we do want to get in as many voices as possible into the room. So do do take up the opportunity and we want to get as much diverse, uh, you know, experiences as possible into the room. So do do share with us. Uh, we will, uh, um, I know our time is supposed to be till uh, one o'clock uh, with the permission of the room. Uh, could we extend that by maybe 10 minutes? Would that be all right with everybody? Uh, yeah. If anybody obviously has a issue, you know, we do understand and we respect that. And if you need to leave, we, we totally believe uh, that that's because, not because we are boring and not because you don't want to be part of the, the conversation, but because you do have to drop out and that's perfectly fine. Yeah, so great. So I think I'm going to take it that we can extend to 110, which leaves us with exactly half an hour remaining uh, to kind of close the session. So I want to now move into a collaborative space, okay? What are the opportunities for collaboration? Because I think we've spoken about the challenges, we've spoken about capability to some degree, okay? Uh, but then I would like to really use the last half an hour to talk about what is it that are some of the opportunities that we can? And I think Dolly has been trying to uh, speak. Yes, Dolly, I'll just come to you in one more second. But I would just want to get the room start thinking about, um, you know, what is it that you can do uh, in terms of collaboration, in terms of offering somebody else, or you may need the collaboration. Do you need something? Are you looking for something specific? Then put your ask in the in the chat table. Do you do you, you have something to offer? put that on the chat table, right? You are here to collaborate. And so we want as many options as possible. Okay, Dolly, over to you, please. So I have, I was in Sydney, as you know, as a DGM. And that's where I realized that most of the women who came for loans were turned down. They were not even, you know, given a meeting with some of the juniors. So that's when I decided that I will empower women to set up their own enterprises. And that's when I started, started after leaving Sydney, this business beacon, where I try to create awareness because I have seen so many schemes which are which are uh, started by government of India, Ministry of MSMEs, but they are not aware. The women are not aware. So creating awareness is the major challenge, which I have been now doing at SPJ and Institute of Management and even in my independent capacity at FIKI. That's one challenge, awareness. Another challenge is collaterals. That's what I was trying to tell you, Carol, that most women are turned down because they don't have collaterals. Because the men can get their FDs or mortgage their house, but uh, banks re require assets. But believe me, women have been repaying their loans more diligently than men. And that has been proved uh, even in statistics. But still, banks turn them down. So now the startup women who have skill and technology, they are encouraged by private equity. So I have a lot of private equity and venture capitalists and angel investors who are investing in women-oriented startups. And women have this skill, but they don't have the collaterals and they don't have the awareness. So that's what I've been trying to create. Well, through all my sessions. Yes, Dolly, that's the other aspect of the financial independence point of view. So it's not only about earning money, it's also about managing money, right? Yes. And, you know, we see that women tend to shy away from doing that. Oh, those financial matters, my husband takes care of it. Oh, yes. matters, my father takes care of it. Or worse, mm -hmm. it becomes my son takes care of it. So what happens is then, you know, you don't have a clue of what you have or what you mm -hmm. don't have or what you can do because you, you really have no idea on this front, right? So I think... Uh, uh, yes, thank you for bringing that up, Dolly. And I think Joy had mentioned it a little earlier in the chat that she yes. has some troubles in terms of getting a bank loan, uh, mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that they, it was supposedly claimed that they give, they have kept aside a special fund for women. Yeah. And I myself have had that. On a personal level, I can get a loan with no paperwork, no paperwork, okay, in no time. But if I go as a woman entrepreneur yes. with a business, the story changes completely. And why? 
it's the same person right i mean give me a break what is it right so so yes i mean really it is it is a big big deal and and as, as an extension to that topic you know in terms of you said about assets that you know banks are looking for assets i think that's the other big thing we don't even mm-hmm. worry about do i have any assets in my name from the family you know kitty so to speak you know we don't really think about that right how much cash really do i have how many things are put in my name you know i do i just blindly sign on something that has been taken in my name but do i know whether i have any rights over it proper to use it or not is it you know 50 50 60 50 20 50 you know 20 80 whatever it is right so i think even the question of assets in the name of a woman is a huge issue uh, in today's day and age and and the reverse of that is also true when you have assets in your name what we call in india the benami uh, transactions that used to you know be very popular sometime before but now thankfully a lot less uh, happening on that front but otherwise that could be the other way where it was completely abused you know using uh, women uh, as the front yeah. line for these kind of transaction so i think these financial issues thank you so much dolly for bringing them up are equally a big issue that we need to kind of uh, there, there, there are there are schemes which are collateral free loans there is a certain amount which is available without collateral but banks are not encouraging it i was just going to do that dolly get it for me because i know the cgts scheme is there yes, is, but it yeah. does I mean, it's no use. We know the scheme exists. No, but we have to follow up. We have to keep chasing. Collateral-free loans are available. Wow. I know women who have got it. Okay, great. That gives me hope. <laughs> Thank yes, you. sure. I'll I'll connect you. To great. Sydney. Right. Awesome. Good. Okay. Do we have anybody else to kind of come in with some ideas and thoughts in terms of collaborations? or solutions that can be taken forward that would be really great to happen and while people are thinking about what they would like to say i do want to bring up a couple of things that we are doing to kind of take this conversation forward so one is that we have a linkedin group that has been set up for all our risers actually and so we hope you connect with us over there so that we can continue to stay in touch continue to have these conversations and find ways to uh, you know uh, find ways to collaborate post the events as well uh, secondly we're doing a research on sdgs okay and of course we all know sdg 5 is about gender and there are so many other G- uh, sdgs that are uh, obviously linked to the uh, sdg 5 target so do do uh, fill up that form we would really really appreciate that and uh, this thing and uh, going forward of course you know what are some of the ways we could possibly explore i will just give some ideas so it does help people to think about it but we can do a lot of knowledge sharing there's a huge amount of knowledge right here in the group right which we could probably look at and uh, explore there is a lot of uh, initiatives which are very very interesting and we could look at how we could probably replicate that in different geographies It would be really awesome to hear that um joy this is for you and tech pixies right <laughs> okay and then there are of course opportunities where we can look at maybe the same target group but offer different kinds of products or services to those uh, to those uh, sectoral issues uh, and last but not the least is of course you know do joint projects okay even if they are not financially uh, what you call they are not financial transactions but do projects jointly and last but not the least would be to actually bid for uh, joint projects as a consortium and and you know carry them out so i think all of these are really really important ways to collaborate and you know obviously the last one is the most difficult and can only happen when you're already comfortable with people so i would encourage us to explore the other four ways at least for the starter and hopefully someday we will have a rise team of women from this panel i mean from this round table who actually can come together and bid for a huge consortium project and execute it for maybe gender benefits right that would be awesome wouldn't that be a great idea if we could do that yeah come on let make make me some noise on the chat table don't you think that's a great idea for us to look at yeah okay great so um yeah so do i have any takers to uh, to come in and maybe offer some concrete ways to collaborate going forward um if i may tell yes please please anupama yeah very briefly though i've already touched upon this um so i have a platform called uh, equal half uh, where uh, you know uh, it's a safe space for men to engage in conversations uh, where they can become allies um, for gender equality 
this platform can work across uh, the spectrum. It can work in a rural uh, setting. It can also work in an urban setting, in a corporate setting, in an entrepreneurial setting, because the topics that we discuss pertain to men and women. Uh, so this is something I would you know, love to collaborate on if somebody would like to uh, uh, you know, uh, work with us and, and, and uh, host us. We'd be more than happy to do this. Within this, we do research, interventions, workshops, and advocacy. Our advocacy piece is called Mardo Mali Baat, um, mm. which we uh, hosted a chat table for yesterday on this, in the summit. Um, besides this, we have a community called Reboot Her, which is a career community for women uh, returners, which is women who want to get back to work um, after a break. Uh, so here uh, we have mentorship and coaching programs. If any one of you are interested in, in uh, you know, joining us uh, and, and become a coach or a mentor for these women based on the domain and the expertise, we are always looking for resources who can come and inspire a community. Thank you very much, Anupama. And of course, your, your uh, booth is also there very much. So exhibition booth. So I hope people do uh, you know, stop by over there. And you've done a great job with the chat table. I've got lovely feedback. So great. Uh, thanks so much for doing that with us. Great. Uh, any, any other thoughts in terms of opportunities to collaborate or any other things that we could probably do? Uh, you know, and that would be really great to know as well. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Minal, please go ahead. Thanks. So I work in the space of uh, discovery of capability, and I believe that those capabilities could be a small, play a small role in shifting the narrative from I'm a woman and that's why I need to succeed, but can we have this platform where there is an equal assessment for everyone and based on those understanding those capabilities discovering those capabilities all through the through the through the context of certain assessment tools etc we are able to build points of view for the people who sign up to our platform and then use those points of views use those kind of experiences conversations to build the brand of the individual and that's the reason why I think it becomes a little bit more empowering in the context of women, where uh, we have to actually create or really use elbow space to sit on the table, make our voices here be heard uh, louder and, you know, all of that. So it's really helping profiling the, the woman and therefore using that as a race or as an angle to position your capabilities and your experience and therefore get higher salaries and become as equal as men, though I don't want to say that, but well, let me practically help. And we are looking at practical solutions. So okay. that is something that I'm very happy to work with, partner with, support uh, any, any, any of you uh, in your organizations or in your communities. Great, thank you so very much. That's really, really awesome. Uh, Great. So, um, any more other thoughts and ideas? We could have a last round of anything. It doesn't have to be about collaboration anymore, but anything that you've not been able to touch on, you've not been able to say something. Yes, Joy, please do come in. Great. Um, well, I would just say that I think it's really important um, for men to be in this conversation, like you said. And I think one of the things that you know, in the UK, you can do is a, a man can take time off and get paid um, as they paternity leave, like you would have maternity leave. But um, it's very interesting because they get paid le less than women. So there's an encouragement for them to the women to stay home and the men not to. So, you know, making those changes there are really important. But I think, interestingly enough, even though that rule came in that men could take time off, very few men took it initially. And it, it was actually only when the CEOs and the leaders in an organization, a male CEO took the, the actual time off that other people did, uh, and other males did. So I think male leadership is really important. It's very important if a, if a man wants to have women uh, have opportunities in their, their business that aren't full-time or that want to have. And here, here's, I think this is my point. The 40 hour work week that was put in place by Henry Ford over 100 years ago does not work anymore. And so when 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 I think what people don't realize, if I were to just flip the conversation for a second, most men that I speak with feel obligated to work full time. They feel obligated to provide for their family and they and so they feel trapped in as equal as the woman feels 
trapped at home, very often men feel trapped in their jobs. And so what happens when we work with women and they start to become free in what they want to do and what they want and start to dream a bit, their husbands get quite jealous because they don't have that freedom to dream about what they could be doing. They feel forced into that work. And it's one of those strange things where I think if, if men were to start saying the 40 hour work week doesn't work and they start changing the cultures in their communities so that they're able to be home more and available more, that e equals it out for everyone. I, I think a 40 hour work week does not work in anymore. And I think we have to stand up and start talking about that and start, start pulling back on the hours. You know, there's the, the law that says we work to the hours that we have available to us. So if we only have, you know, yeah. 20 hours available to us, but we've, we've got, we, we can, we can change and adapt. And I, I don't know how we do it, but I do think that the men who run the companies and who are the leaders, if they want the change to happen, they have to be the change. And so it's somehow getting them to take that initiative. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I, I think this is the other, other, what should I say, shocker that I come up with in, again, you know, when I talk about gender balance and gender, that uh, we don't think about men enough in the gender conversation. You know, we take it from uh, the women's perspective all the time and we really don't realize and what you just said, you know, about how men feel trapped about this kind of expectations that are there from them, etc. I think I, I completely 200% agree with you, Joy, because I think um, I have been, uh, you know, you know, in, in India, engineering in my when I did my engineering, so now you know how old I am. Okay, uh, we didn't have you know many uh, women who really uh, took up, uh, and definitely not computer science. So, so with when we did that, uh, I I was always you know with so many. I mean, we were always a minority, just two women with you know. Um, 20, 25 men at one time, anywhere we came. So, so that is the least. And my class was of 60, 60 people out of which we were just five women total. Okay, we have 60 plus people. So obviously when you have a situation like this, you know so many men uh, who, who are great guys, absolutely great guys. And you know, and they they sometimes when they, they would tell me and say, you know, you, and today obviously we are all at this age, right? Where we've got a lot of experience, family, you know, coming to the end of our kind of supposed um, formal careers and things like that. You know, they're like, you know, I can't retire. I can't just stop working, you know, it's just not possible, right? Whereas a woman could always say that, look, you know what, I want to stay back, you know, I don't want to work. And I'm, and please, I don't, please understand, you know, that's why I said sometimes this becomes a shocker because people feel that I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not justified in saying this, but I completely agree with what you say, Joy. And I think bringing in the gender, when we talk about gender, that's why I never use about the word women empowerment. I think it's about gender issues and gender issues is about both men and women. Because the women's issues start from men uh, mindsets many very often, and a lot of men issues start because they don't know how to deal with women issues. So I think bring making sure you're talking about both sides of that coin becomes really really important. Okay, great. I'm sorry. I think we have Dr. Rama who wants to say a few words, and I'd love to bring her in. Uh, Rama, you have been a major part of the uh, rise journey, being part of the core committee, and I'm so glad that I have you to say something at least uh, towards the end, if not. Before this. Uh, yeah, thank you, Karen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, 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 clearly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I've been teaching in a, a all girls college for the last 25 years. So I fully agree with what Sarmila said and Rajat said, how there has to be a mindset change of the parents as well as the younger generation also. And secondly, what uh, Pavan Singh said, a lot of opportunities are there where women can explore. That is one thing. Um, the second thing which uh, Meenal mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the training or the collaboration for improving the skill set. So I just want to ask Meenal if it can be done even for students uh, who are still uh, doing their undergraduation and uh, postgraduation. Uh, secondly, I have my student here, Ume Salma, who would like to talk. So I'm actually uh, the thing very opportunity because she's a little uh, apprehensive and little shy. Ki. There are so many, but I think we must listen to a student's perspective also. So I would request Ume, uh, you know, give Ume a chance to speak for a minute Excuse also. Me, Rama, where were you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> See, actually, we had exams. Yeah, you also oh, Ume just joined after her exam. Ah, yes, yes. Okay, I understand. Please, please, please. Uh, is she with you? And will she or she's? 
Ma'am, uh, okay. so hey yeah. everyone. Uh, my name is Umesh Lamma, and I'm a third year English literature student. Uh, so, as the topic of conversation goes about the gender uh, empowerment, and as Joy Ma'am said that you know, uh, men sometimes men also feel trapped in their workplace. I think, um, and, and this is from a personal experience in India. and i'm not sure about other countries but in india at least we have these uh, have this stigma of people if you do not take a science field you're not good enough to be uh, like if you're not a science graduate then you are a duffer this is the word that's being uh, used if you're an arts graduate if you and, and this has been said to me not, thankfully not by my parents but by others uh, who say that why why do you do arts why do you do english and uh, i think that at least as a woman I, I, like as a girl child i had the i had more freedom to take arts than a boy my age would ever have had uh i have seen my father not following his passion because he had to support a family and become an engineer even though his pa- passion was um, wildlife but i at least because i don't uh, f- from the society point of view i don't have the obligation to earn that is why i can do anything even if it's like um the so called uh, unworthy english literature degree because i don't have to earn right so it's okay for me to take an arts uh, uh, to take uh, take up arts even though i might be capable of excelling it at, at it so i think that is where you know men also men are also uh, trapped and uh, burdened with this entire um, gender conflict as much as women are great thank you so very much for bringing in that perspective i think it's so uh, heartening to see that a young uh, you know girl can think about what her father has kind of uh, had to do. i think mean, i think it's a great lesson right uh, for us to kind of so okay yes professor menon please come in yeah thank you karen I, I think that uh, you know this is actually not a conflict, and this is not an adversarial issue. You know, gender equality is something which has to be addressed with uh, the sensitivity, uh, with uh, certain values which we actually have been uh, brought up. Okay, I think it's a part of upbringing. It's a part of also a, uh, you know a realization that uh, you know we need to look at this as a, a rights issue. as a sensitivity issue and as a sensibility issue you know when you look at it i'll use a metaphor you know think of a cot which has got four legs but uh, the two legs are longer than the two shorter legs and the two shorter legs are the the women and the two longer legs are the men so you know to bring gender equality and gender equity we are not saying that saw of the longer leg to make the two legs equal but what we need to do is to put bricks under the smaller leg so that you know the the cot is actually balanced you know so it's not an adversarial issue it has to be seen with sensitivity because working women work in two shifts they work at home and they work in office you know uh, look at the the imagine of uh, Uh, you know a, a local train in mumbai where the women are actually coming back from uh, office going back home but they are cutting the vegetables sitting in the local compartment okay and you see that as a as a very powerful image which we need to recognize so i think that uh, the issue is not adversarial the issue is one of understanding and sensitivity which we need to really work together and if we can look at uh, the 37 universities in india which conduct courses on gender studies you know collaboration would actually be bringing in that element of sensitivity among faculty members and also students doing gender studies to really see along with students doing social work and psychology you know you need to bring together some kind of a, a collective where multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity really comes in and i think that will be one of the major contributions which our summit can do thank you 
Absolutely. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Menon. That definitely is a way forward for all of us to consider and look at. Uh, great. So I think we are kind of coming to the end of what we uh, started out with. Uh, I don't know how much we have achieved specific objectives with which we uh, kind of, uh, you know, decided to come for this program, um, for this roundtable at least. But I hope it has been, you know, of uh, some value to all of you. And I would really appreciate if you could perhaps give me some feedback. Yeah, on the chat box is great. And you know what? I want to say one thing. We spoke about women supporting women. But when I asked you all about, you know, whether you all agree with me, the only person who did was Mr. Kumar. I must say that. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, that's okay. I understand. We are all very busy and we're all thinking so many things and so you sometimes don't uh, don't relate. But now's your chance to do that. So if, if you have uh, really uh, any feedback to give us, any comments to give us about the uh, about this round table and what you're taking away from it, you know, I would really, really urge you to put it down in the chat box. And also overall about the summit, if there are anything that you'd like to share, please do so now. Yeah. Okay. All right. So now we come to the end where I do want to say a big, big thank you to uh, all my experts who really made the time. And of course, starting with Joy, because uh, she's been up since 5 a.m. for this specially. So thank you. Yes, the cup of coffee brought by your husband would make a big difference. And thank you for my, my Tech Pixie cup. I still have it. It's in my office. I don't, so obviously it's not at home. And now I'm, I'm working from home, so I don't have it here. Otherwise, I would have loved to have had it and shared that, showed it to you just now. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, starting with Joy, as I said, Minal, it was really wonderful. You're signing in from Singapore. So thank you again for doing that with us. Uh, thank you very much. Sonal is uh, slightly unwell, and so she had to drop out uh, but she made it again uh, like I said you know women supporting women right I mean she, she made it a point to join the, the round table so that was really great uh, Urushi again uh, really really busy schedules but taking time off to uh, be a part of that and of course Anupama uh, being with us right through the whole Rise Summit not just for the round table uh, has always been a part of all our gender work and I, you know we had that amazing uh, workshop that we did together which I think brought a lot of insights especially from the corporate world so uh, thank you all for joining us and being with us thank you all the participants and I'm so glad we had a mix of both uh, men and women in this call yeah